Hi guys, welcome back to Snakes and Adders Reptile Advice. It's been a while since we've done an uh, episode of this and we've been doing the quizzes trying to keep people entertained and you know everyone's fed up and tired and they're maybe not getting the response that they once were and we want to make sure that we use the opportunity to try and keep educating. In, in total truth and being completely frank, it's difficult to stay motivated at the moment um there's it just seems like groundhog day every day is the same and particularly with the shop always trading on sunday hours 11 till 4 it makes it all the more difficult as well so i wanted to go back to a subject that i found interesting um and uh, it's something that helps scientists work out where a species belongs um whether it's related to others um and if there's other subspecies and we're going to go through and just maybe work through each of the different scale groups and types on a snake's head. We'll look at the importance of the tails, how it can be used for both sexing, but also, again, differentiation of subspecies. And we've got an example there. The scoots themselves. So scales are called scoots and the study of scoots is, ignore my handwriting, it's crap, is scoot. Scutellation. So that's what we're going to look at. Scutellation and names of snakes' heads predominantly. And we'll touch on some other bits as we go. If you've got snakes, after you've done this video or even during the video, maybe get your snake out and have a look. And you can be studying the snake's head while I'm explaining these. And we can give each of these scales or plates a name. Now, a word of warning. Boa constrictors have granular head scales or predominantly granular head scales and from these sort of outer rim scales back it can be granulate so it doesn't really apply to the boa constrictors but most of the uh, colubrids, bullpine gophers have plates and pythons have plates as well and I'll state categorically from the beginning this isn't my artwork this was borrowed online from a scientific paper these two pictures uh, were from the uh, Pythons of the World Volume 1 Australia by Dave and Tracy Barker, Vida Precosa International. They have fabulous line drawings for each species. And I picked one of my absolute favourite species of all time, which is the white lip python, Bothrachillus albertese, to use as our subject. Uh, this was taken from monograph of the genus Alafi Fitzinger by Klaus Dieter Schultz. And the body cross-reference cross was taken from Chris Matteson's Encyclopedia of Snakes. Uh, again, this was just a Google search to show uh, the, the skeleton and, and skull of the head and how, uh, how that fits together. So, well, without further ado, where do we start, eh? So, one of the most tough scales, the one that's got to put up with the biggest kick in, is one called the rostral scale. This can be specialised. So if you look at things like Heterodon, which are the Western Hognose, they have a spike. We also have um, the Langahas in stock, which are the Malagasy Leaf Noses, which have a proboscis. So, um, and also uh, you can get animals that have got a toughened plate where it's enlarged and thicker than usual. And that would be the Pituophis, which is the Bullpine and Gove Snakes. And what was Ryan... Rhinetchis, but is now Zemenis scalaris, which is the ladder snake. So on both of these, we can see the rostral scale. And there is a notch in the bottom of this that we call the rostral notch, and that is for the tongue. So they are the rostral scales. Again, please, uh, I, I'm probably going to go back and realise I've not written this stuff big enough, but try and keep up with me. This is going to be quite a long video, and obviously drawing this stuff on, I only really get one pass to do this. So if I cock up, I can't really pause. I've just got to keep going and muddle through. So I hope it's okay. Obviously then, the next choice is the ones with the nostrils. As you might have guessed it, these are called nasal scales. So the ones that go in between those are internasal scales. So, 
concentrating on the nasal scales and the internasal scales, certain vipers such as Bitis gabonica and Bitis nasicornis, the rhino viper, will have specialised nasal or internasal scales. Then we're going to have a look. Oh, let me do. I'll do the uh, nasal there. Try and keep this all neat and tidy. I'm probably going to forget stuff. You're just going to have to forgive me, guys. You know. Uh, and then what we've got is a major plate, which is usually in the center of the head. And we call this the frontal scale. And in human skulls, this is called the frontal lobe. So this is where it's borrowed from. There are a few bits in the naming of these scales that are borrowed from the naming of the human skull. So if we have a frontal, what do we propose that these two in front are called? They're before the frontal, so they're a prefrontal. Now in this illustration there's two, but bear in mind that the scalation of many snakes is different. And I'm using one example, but there could be a hundred examples that you could use. So you might have got four or maybe even six prefrontals, but they'll usually just be a single frontal plate. So we'll put these on here as well. So we've got prefrontals. So what we've then got is the scales around the eye. We, if you watched our quiz the other day, the proper name for the scale that covers the eye is called the brill and is shed with the rest of the epidermis when an animal sloughs its skin. So the scales surrounding the eyes have usually got something to do with an eye reference. So this guy, in front, where are we? Let me think about the way I'm going to draw this in. Immediately in front of the eye is called a pre-ocular. So let's have that there. Pre-ocular. There we go. If we're above something, we are supra. That's what they determine it to be. So this is a supra. Oh, drop my lid. First cock for the video. Supra ocular. So we can now draw those in here. One. Oh, I needed a longer ruler. Oh my god. There we go. These are our supra, as in Toyota Supra, ocular. And then, oh, oh, there we go. It's all gonna pot already, you see? All gonna pot. So if we've got a preocular there, we've got a preocular here. Okie dokie. We get in there now, right. These scales, we've managed to miss one in between the eyes and between the nasal scale. And these are called L'Oreal scales. Again, the preoculars and the L'Oreals can be split or divided. And there can be a cluster of them. In fact, the preoculars, I believe that there was a cluster of three found on, I believe it was Borneo blood pythons, which was enough to shift it to its own subspecies. They've since been elevated to their own uh, species you might have to correct me it could have been the the, the Sumatran short tail one of the blood pythons I remember that much had granular preoculars in between the prefrontals and these lip scales which we'll get to in a moment and that was one of the deciding factors so this is a L'Oreal like the beauty products so L'Oreal which means that we've also then got, you can't see it on that one, but we've got our opposite number there, L'Oreal. 
see it's getting busy now hopefully we can make out all this dodgy left-handed writing that i'm putting in but we'll see so if this edge was the lip that runs along if it's above what prefix would we give it yep like we discussed earlier supra so it is a supra labial i'm not going to do them all because it will get too busy and too hellish so supra labial labial meaning lip so if i do the first few It makes sense. Yes, hopefully. Get that, supralabials. Can't see them particularly well on this, so I'm not gonna bother drawing them in. And then, if we are underneath, the prefix is infra. So these lower scales are called infra labial. So let's draw the first few of these in. So either the supralabial or infralabial can also be specialised. And in this we can see it to um, a certain extent because of the infra infralabial heat pits present on many Bothrachillus and Liasis pythons. The true pythons and the carpet pythons Morelia, they ha also have the front heat pits like the Bothrachillus does as well. If we look at one of the truly specialised snakes, like the uh, Emerald Tree Boa, then pretty much every supra and infralabial scale has got deep recessed heat pits. And then, in such as the Pit Vipers, a uh, crotalid eye, then the, I believe it is the L'Oreal scale, is um, specialised by having the hollow hook heat pit there but it could well be a preocular but i believe that it's a l'oreal again correct me if i'm wrong and obviously on the emerald these then become the huge recessed cavities that we see giving it the look of a like lamborghini designed it or something when we start getting into this hopefully you're picking up on just how um much detail one scientist have gone into, but also just how intricate the design of your snake is. It's an amazing piece of design with all of these scales doing different jobs. And then if we have them split in different ways, so say the prefrontals are split and we've got four scales, or we might have got a cluster of four preoculars. You can see how this then changes. So don't go thinking that there's ones missed out. They, these are the defined positions of scales and then you can have multiples of those scales. Generally speaking, it's just the frontals normally a, a large single scale and then everything else moves on from that. So when we did the quiz as well, we talked about the parietal eye or the pine pineal eye on lizards where the scale is thin and it lets a certain amount of light through. It doesn't do that in snakes, but we still have a parietal, pair of parietal scales which are these, which are the plates immediately behind the frontal. Can we see them on you? Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, so one of you, at least. Maybe that's the top of that one there. So, parietal. And then the scales that aren't regular, you see how we're going to start getting regular scales here and it starts to become moving back. They're just standard scoots. They're not specialised as such. So the ones that cluster around the supraocular parietal and the parietal scales are called temporal scales. Like, um, oh God, temple, a human temple. So we've got a temporal bone here. So these are... The best way to draw this one is, here we go, you'll get the picture. So, one, two, three, four, and then the opposite number around there are temporal scales. So, 
So um, what we can also do, which this species doesn't have, but I wanted to show it, um, is we get suboculars. Which can be clustered scales beneath the eye, which this species doesn't have and it's therefore not illustrated, but it's hard to get a picture with every scale represented subocular. So, as you can see, this is pretty busy stuff. So even if you've got something just as simple as a corn snake or a royal python, you should be able to just sit and study and look at its head, particularly if you're gentle and soft, and just have, you know, a peruse of these and work through. Can you identify the parietal scales? Can you identify the frontal scales, superoculars, internasals, the rostrals? So it's, it's, it seems like nothing, but it is super super interesting um and i just I, th I think that it's something that people don't look at a huge amount what we can move on to is say this is the head and that's one way that the scientists would potentially appraise a new species or subspecies and they, the linographs these line drawings are incredibly important and that's why you see the old school artworks with not only the patination but there would also be some sort of focus on the head where we could identify the scalation the shape overall shape you didn't need to be a brilliant artist but the scales the scutellation was important for identification later on and then what we as we move down into these standard plates here we go through the different phases of scales and this was useful because this was from a rat snake book and they're highly variable in the way that they form but it follows through in many different species so we've got truly truly flat scales which more than likely are going to be highly iridescent and refract the light because of these tiny tiny ridges on them so an example we could give of that which is super reflective would be the sunbeam snake or rainbow boa. So these are highly iridescent snakes and the light hits and refracts off like dark side of the moon pink Floyd. That's the job there. This is Xenopeltis. And this is Epicrates Centria. Sorry, it's all getting clustered up, but there's a lot to go through, and I hope it's I hope it's interesting anyway. So B, their opposite number. These are called keeled scales, carinata or carinatus in Latin or Greek, whichever one it is, means keeled, boat-like, bottom of the ship. So we can use that, and we can get that example, and we're going to give one that we only did a guide video on the other day, which is the king rat snake. King rat, I prefer. Stinking Goddess, because it's a far cooler name. And its Latin name is a Lafe Carinata, meaning rough scaled rat snake. Not king rat snake, its true name, rough scaled rat snake, according to the Latin anyway. Then we have the halfway house, where they're just gently killed. And your corn snake, if you look closely at your corn, you'll see just an ever such a slight keel to the scales. So we'll use that as the example for this, Pantherophis guttatus. Which is the corn snake. Going back to the keeled scales, what you can find is some of these become specialised and they almost become like spikes. So the hairy bush viper develops these spiked, elongated plates. The saw-scaled viper uses these keels to be able to make a noise, as does the egg-eating snake's dasipeltis. So each of these modifications has a purpose and reason. What we can also do, as well as look at these scales, we can look at the tail. So these, these if I continue drawing in what would be the normal belly scales, before that point. These are called ventrals. Cordus or caudal means tail. So if you are sub, you are beneath. So a sub caudal scale is a tail scale. Now, sex organs in snakes are stored inside the tail. 
and males usually have a far longer tail because they have bits to fit in and this can affect the amount of subcaudal scales but equally we can use a metal rod called a probe which is usually ball tipped and heavily lubricated before use that we can slide from the cloaca which is the vent the bum the ass and we're going to slide the probe up now a female may only reach one two or three scales generally whereas a boy could go between anything between sort of in the sh even in the short tailed stuff six or seven scales right up to 15 or 16 scales if we think of the particularly you've got elong gate snakes such as uh, the vietnamese blue beauties or taiwan beauties which were orthriophis i think they're now laughing again but for this orthriophis tenuris free c and calisianus they probe to extraordinary lengths and you can see this is the passage up the hem hemipenal pocket uh, which is basically an external groove on the shaft of the penis and it allows the probe to pass up what we can then look at as well so this is all tying together to give an overview of a snake and it would be the things that a scientist would work through and denote and note down to be able to make an accurate account of a species what they would also look at is cross section and then we can look at the different cross sections and we could maybe attribute these to a different style or type of species so the round snakes, because they need as much surface area in as possible for burrowing and they need to be in contact with the surface as much as possible, this tends to be for the more fossorial snakes. So we would be like the blind snakes, uh, rosy boas, sand boas, and again, sunbeam snake. Triangular set snakes, the old Toblerones. One great example of this, particularly when it's bigger, is the indigo snake, which is dry mark on Caress cooperi, uh, and the Kribos, which is just dry mark on Caress. Huge, heavy bodied snakes, but very, very triangular in cross section. Also, uh, a, a heavily tri like triangle shape uh, with quite a prominent uh, spine section is a genus called Bungarus, which is the Crates. And that is great, which is a type of a lapid, the cobra family, a uh, proteroglyph, which we'll get to in a moment. Flattened sausage, great big fat thing. Yep, we have got the vipers mainly. So we have the gaboon, puff adder, which is bitis gabonica. Vitis aritans, and to a lesser extent, some of the larger, heavier bodied crotalus, which are the rattlers. So, this weird shape here, what's that one? These are nearly always exclusively either arboreal or sea snakes. So, if they are compressed and taller than they are wide, it will either be for propellants in water. So, the sea snakes have a a, a um, posteriorly flattened tail or uh, this shape seems to benefit the arboreal snakes such as Corallus hortulanus also known as the Amazon tree boa Hortulanus apologies I nearly spelled that wrong which is the Amazon tree boa ATB or long nosed vine snake a Hatola which I probably can't spell, A-H-E-T-U-L-L-A, -L -L that looks about right, Prasina. Again, so take a look at your cross-section of snake. What this doesn't show is things like the Pantherophis, which are a halfway house, and they do a bit of climbing, and then they're on the ground as well. So they generally have quite a, a specialised ventral edge, which is like a loaf of bread. So I'm going to draw this one in and it's a sharp edge to the ventral scale and then the back and usually they're quite muscular so they have like a fillet running either side of the spine and it gives them like a loaf of bread overview. So if that's the spine and then we've got these fillets of muscle either side and down here and this is the ventral edge which we can dig into rough bark on a tree and the best proponents of this are the Pantherophis, the North American rat snakes.
so again another body shape so again, we're now we're getting this wonderful overview where you're going to sit, hopefully, and look at your corn, your king, your milk, your bull, your pie, and your gopher. You could maybe take a close-up still photograph of the head, and you could even go through and print the picture and be able to label each of the scales and be able to identify the scale counts. When you read these books, you read about scale counts, and it's probably a page you just flick past. You didn't quite understand what it meant. This is what it means. And this is how we identify what a snake is. So as well as scalation, the numbers of scales, the type of scales, the length or shortness of the tail. Another example of this, subspecies specific, boa constrictor longicorda, long tail boa, boa constrictor amarali, short tail boa. Same species, different subspecies. And caudal scales were a major player in the decision. Okay, or subcordal scales, sorry. Then also what they'll do is more likely with their specimens is they would look at dentition, so their teeth, but also the skeletal makeup. And we've got three separate groups identified in this image. This is a non-venomous python. So there is no specialized teeth. They are just recurved teeth fixed in place to the maxilla and the mandible. Then we also have a group called the epistoglyphs, which are rear fanged snakes, either a single or a pair. And examples of this would be false water cobra, Hydrodynastes gigas, uh, Heterodonaceus, which is the western hognose, and the boom slang, and, oh, I'm trying to think, mangrove snake. These have all got specialised teeth to the rear, and they're called epistoglyphs. This is a fixed frontal fang that does not swing and does not articulate, which is the word that they use. So this is opistoglyph. This is proteroglyph, I think. Check that. Proteroglyph, front fixed fangs, cobras, crates, taipans, mambas, these. Then we have the third, the articulating teeth, and these are called solenoglyphs. A solenoglyph, sol, glyph. And solenoglyphs are the vipers, uh, pit vipers. So uh, Viperiburus, which is the common adder, Vitis gabonica, which is the gaboon viper, uh, Crotalus atrox, which is the diamondback rattler, uh, what's the other one? Uh, Crotalus adamantius, which is the eastern or western diamondback. I get confused. But they are all selenoglyphs. So as they open up, the, the fangs move forward. Because they fold back, this gives them the ability to have far larger fangs than other snakes. So the record is held by the Gaboon Viper with something like something ridiculous, like teeth an inch and a half long. Uh, and they are hollow um, teeth that inject and backfire. With the pteroglyphs, certain ones have got a specialised hole at the front which whilst under pressure, sprays venom from those fangs. So they're, they're definitives and groups. So the epistoglyphs are exclusively in colubridae, as far as I'm aware. Proteroglyphs are known as the cobras, and selenoglyphs are known as the vipers. And this is, what from there we would move on to, right, now, how many scales has it got? How does that relate to its other cousins in the area? What's its scalation like? Has it been specialised? Is it like a saw scale viper? Blah, blah, blah. How long is its tail? What's the probe depth for male and female? What's the cross section of the body? What they'll also do is take diagonal scale counts from the ventral scales at the bottom across the back. They'll do it diagonally and then they'll also do it straight through as well and they will take those numbers and the bigger the group of animals they have to work with the better and they can then take an average or a range and that is also presented in the text and papers so this is a basic overview of how to appraise a snake species and i find it wonderfully interesting and i hope that you do too it's not supposed to be a scientific video it's not supposed to be overly complicated all we've done is name a few scales and talk about the different scales and their uses and how that can affect the way that things are classified get your pet snake have a look study its scales try and take a close-up clear photograph and print it out with a white background preferably and then you can go through and do these labelings yourself and you'll be able to have an idea it'd be wicked if you could show us some of those pictures 
in uh in the comments particularly on facebook i'd love to see them that you've gone to the effort to do it particularly kids if you watch it don't be confused by these names they're nothing special they're just the names that the scientists have given them okay i hope you enjoyed that we'll be back with another educational video soon enough big love stay safe stay home protect the nhs we love you all loads we'll see you soon from Chaz and mr p peace